Coming up on SBU TV, a St. Bonaventure student is recognized for a dedication to the Jandoli School, and we visit the Warming House's new home. Hello and welcome to SBU TV. I'm Kevin Clark. And I'm Connor Mooney. One journalism and mass communication student is chosen each year to receive the Woman of Promise Award. The award is given to a student who shows promise in all future endeavors after graduation. The 10th annual Dr. Mary A. Hamilton Woman of Promise Award was presented to senior Talbot Eckweiler Tuesday. Tabit says she has a passion for photography and has her work published in several on-campus publications as well as the Linger Longer Cafe in Allegheny. She has made the Dean's List each semester at St. Bonaventure and is a member of the National Society of Leadership and Success among other accomplishments. After graduation, Tabit plans to pursue a master's degree in the fine arts and creative writing. 2006 St. Bonaventure graduate and Women of Promise Award recipient Lois Bennett Arbogast presented Tabit with the award. The Warming House in Olean is the oldest student-run soup kitchen in the United States. Some recent building availability problems caused it to move to a new location. But that's not the only thing that's changing at the Warming House, SBU TV's Lauren Adams reports. Earlier this month, the Warming House moved from this location on Main Street to this one on North Union Street. But that hasn't stopped the guests from coming. You can just tell that they really like this place. They want to make it their home. They want it to, you know, stay clean, and they, and they want to know what they can do to help. Volunteers say this is a pleasant change from the old location where they face some problems with city officials. Loitering, uh, people congregating outside the building, um, you know, cigarette butts here and there, people making a scene and everything. The new warming house is bigger, cleaner, and offers more space for cooking and serving meals. It really is just you know, light years apart from, from the old place. It's, it's so much nicer. Size isn't the only difference between the two locations. The warming house has added a small classroom and a couple computers. They plan to begin holding classes for the guests here later this year, an addition that volunteers hope will benefit everyone. Enable them and empower them, you know, to do better, you know, with their life so they can be more independent. To try to get these people involved in different classes, to get them motivated and doing other activities and different things. While it's undergone many changes, the spirit of the soup kitchen remains the same. We obviously keep the identity alive. I mean, it's still the warming house, it's still the same place, and we still, you know, practice the same things, you know, the same ideas. For SBU TV, I'm Lauren Adams. The Warming House is always looking for volunteers to assist with preparing and serving meals. If you're interested in helping out, contact Nick Adell at ngadell at sbu.edu. Looking for an affordable trip home on spring breaks? Want to share a, the burden of a long car ride with someone else? Facebook may have the answer. The social network, Facebook, has been connecting students since the site's creation. Now, a Facebook group on the St. Bonaventure network allows students to coordinate carpools on breaks and weekends, saving students hundreds of dollars on gas and developing new relationships with classmates. It kind of just came about one day, actually on our drive home, our eight hour drive home. You know, why don't we have like a notice board or something like that, or like some kind of board that you could put rides up on, like whether or not you have a car or you need a ride. And I was like, well, why not have an online source for that? And Obviously, Facebook came to mind. With over 300 members, the Bonaventure Carpooling Network on Facebook has become quite a popular commodity. I've used the Bonaventure Carpool Network on Facebook a bunch of times. It's extremely convenient because there are literally hundreds of people that go here and are members of the network. I highly recommend it. The Carpooling Network isn't just for New York State. It includes a variety of states, some several hundreds of miles away. Um, so I heard about it online through a few friends. Um, they were kind of skeptical, but I tried it out, and uh, I needed to get east, and there were some people that were actually heading further than I wanted to go, but was still able to make that work. Got where I needed to go, so I definitely recommend it, and it's uh, really functional. But before making that long journey, remember, there is a group on Facebook for Bonaventure students to carpool home, and it may just save you a little bit of money. For SPU TV, I'm Joe Landers. Students can log on to Facebook and type in Bonas Carpool Network if they are interested.
March 14th was just another ordinary day for most of us, but for some it's a mathematical celebration with a sense of humor. SBU TV's Brittany Wally reports. Pi, or 3.14, is a symbol for the ratio of the circumference of a circle to its diameter. In other words, if you measure around the edge of a circle and divide by the distance across the circle, the result is the number pi. This past Monday, St. Bonaventure marked its 7th annual Pi Day celebration. We invite the entire campus to celebrate Pi Day with us uh, so that folks know that math is uh, fun. The math is not only uh, something that they might use in their lives, but it's, it's a good time as well. Dr. Hill and fellow professors of the math department make sure that all the details of this event connect with Pi. The date of Pi Day, March 14th, corresponds to 3.14. The next three digits of pi are 159. So we start the event at 159 in the afternoon. The next three digits of pi after 159 are 265, so we run the event for two hours and 65 minutes. Students and faculty celebrated their holiday by eating, what else, more than 10 different types of pie and 3.14 ounce packages of M&Ms. For the first time this year, we had a pie costume contest. I had no idea what might result of that, but some people did that. No matter which pie you prefer, this event was a tasty one. For SBU TV, my favorite pie is cherry, and I'm Brittany Wally. Those who are interested in their own personal piece of pie can log on to angio.net slash pie and find out where their birthday lies within the first 200 million digits of pie. Next on SBU TV, we find out about the tragic national disaster in Japan. On Friday, March 11th, a catastrophic earthquake hit Japan. But the Japanese aren't the only ones worried about the safety of the country. Aaron Lowry reports. The world watched the past week as the earthquake in Japan devastated the nation. But for one St. Bonaventure student, it was personal. Well, I went to high school there for all four years. My dad still lives there. I woke up and my dad had emailed me and told me about it, told me that Everybody at school, everybody I knew was safe. But Koliani was one of many in America who woke to see images of destruction to a land they call home. University of Michigan student Lillian Madrigal also found out about the earthquake from an email her mom sent that her family was safe. I was just in shock. I didn't, couldn't really process it at the time, but just watching more of the footage on TV that day, it was just so terrible and so devastating. It's just been pretty hard to watch and hard to be so far away from uh, my home. The 9.0 magnitude earthquake triggered a tsunami that wiped out towns. The quake and aftershocks also caused damage to Japan's nuclear power plants. But Koliani and Madrigal agree that Japan can overcome this. Japanese people are very resilient. They're hardworking, and I know that if there's any country that would be able to deal with this kind of disaster, it would be Japan. When things like this happen, people um, are very respectful to each other. They stay calm. Um, there's no looting. There's no chaos. Um, everybody just comes together to help each other and um, restore their community, and I think that's exactly what we're going to see here. For SBU TV, I'm Aaron Lowry. 7,000 are dead and another 10,000 are missing, with almost half a million Japanese citizens now homeless. Many Americans who have seen the devastating pictures out of Japan want to do something to help victims of last week's earthquake and tsunami. But with so many charitable giving efforts popping up in the wake of the disaster, it's especially important to think before you give. Karen Kaifa has tips for safe giving in today's Consumer Watch. The startling pictures of the wreckage left behind from Japan's earthquake and tsunami might have you wondering how you can help. Charity watchdog site Charity Navigator offers safety tips for those considering a gift, including giving to established charities and, even better, one that has previous experience in Japan. Your money is more likely to have an impact if the organization has a solid track record of responding to major disasters rather than a fledgling group with less experience. Text messaging has become a popular way to contribute with a donation tacked on to your monthly mobile bill. But make sure you know where that money is really going by doing homework first. And be mindful there may be additional costs to send that gift. 
you may see a lot of links in your Facebook or Twitter feeds pointing you towards third party charity sites. But just because it looks like a friend or follower has endorsed the link doesn't mean you shouldn't do some vetting of your own. There are also some options through sites that consumers use every day. Group buying site Groupon has offered users the opportunity to donate to relief efforts in the region the same way they'd purchase the daily deal, while Living Social has a link to a relief fund on their site as well. For Consumer Watch, I'm Karen Gaifa. Just two weeks after being reunited at a welcoming ceremony to greet new Sabres owner Terry Bagula, French Connection member Rick Martin lost his life in a car accident. SBU TV's Christy Andieski spoke with one St. Bonaventure faculty member who knew Martin both on and off the ice. He was uh, always on chasing uh, pretty girls, you know, so he like, we called him the suave Rico Martin, you know. Rico is how St. Bonaventure broadcast professor Paul Whelan refers to former Buffalo Sabres player Rick Martin who died in a car accident Sunday. He was 59 years old. Though many remember Martin for his stellar hockey career, Whelan remembers him as a close friend. That friendship uh, started in uh, 1971 and lasted until last week. That friendship began on the ice at one of Martin's first practices as a Buffalo Sabre. I skated out on the ice and he goes, what are you doing out here? You're the PR guy, aren't you? Whelan was the Sabres PR director, but he also suited up with the team as the practice goalie. He said, we got to watch out for my shot because I have a wicked shot. And he did. He'd shoot the puck maybe 105 miles an hour. Martin played alongside former Sabres players Rene Robert and Jabert Perrault. The three became known as the French Connection. So he played on the line with two other French Canadian players and they were the best line, arguably maybe the best line that ever played together in the league. Whelan's not the only member of the Giandoli school to have close ties to the legendary trio. The name French Connection itself was given by the school's dean, Lee Coppola. And Dean Coppola wrote, ooh la la, the French Connection, and that's where the line got its name. It's a part of hockey history now. Whelan says Martin's talent was rare and something that may not be seen in hockey today. Well, he averaged 47 goals a year, and if you if you take a look at the records, uh, there, there's not probably not going to be maybe one player in the league in the whole league this year that'll get 47 goals. Looking back, Whelan says he said goodbye to his friend the best way he could have. The last time I was with him, we drank beer, had lunch, and told stories. For SBU TV, I'm Christy Angieski. Whelan's book, and then Perro said to Rico, is named after Rick Martin. St. Bonaventure students are preparing for this year's drama, Spring Production. The play, Burial at Thebes, directed by Dr. Ed Simone, is based on the Greek tragedy Antigone. Burial at Thebes opens Wednesday, March 23rd, and runs through March 26th at 7.30 in the Quick Center for the Arts. Tickets are $6 for St. Bonaventure students and employees, and are $8 for the public. Free student rush tickets are available at the box office beginning at 6.30 before every show. More and more buzz surrounding the university's Glee-themed music video and Flash Mob is making its way across campus. The marketing music video campaign is nearly complete. Andrew Serrato reports. Last month, SBU TV did a story on the St. Bonaventure music video and Flash Mob. Since then, the 11-person ensemble has been hard at work. The group traveled to Buffalo, New York to GV Audio Studios to work with producer Glenn Bernardis, who has extensive experience serving famous clients, such as the Buffalo Philharmonic Orchestra. The university officially announced the group recorded, mixed, and mastered a Bonaventure-themed rendition of a popular contemporary song. Now that the recording process is over, filming the music video and flash mob are the only remaining elements in the university's new marketing project. The St. Bonaventure hip-hop team is directing the choreography and is taking part in the music video and flash mob. Vice President of University Relations Dr. Emily Sinsenbaugh said her reasoning behind employing the Glee-inspired project is in hopes of marketing the St. Bonaventure donors and alumni in a non-traditional, more creative manner. For more information on the St. Bonaventure Flash Mob music video, visit St. Bonaventure's official Twitter and Facebook to watch a video blog documenting the progress. For SBU TV, I'm Andrew Serrato. The university encourages any student interested in participating in a flash mob music video to contact the Office of Marketing and Communications. 
Coming up in sports, the women's basketball team returns to the WNIT, and the baseball team opens its home schedule against Niagara. Three weeks ago, SBU TV brought you a story on a basketball superfan gearing up for his final home game in the student section. During that game, the banana ran into some trouble. The outcome wasn't very appealing. Tyler Diedrich reports. Tim Schneider may be better known to the St. Bonaventure community as the banana in the student section of basketball games. But during his last game as the banana, St. Bonaventure security determined his actions crossed the line, literally. He asked me to step back from out of the carpet, and so I did, but I guess I had to be told multiple times, and after a while, at half time, they had enough and they asked me to leave. Schneider snuck back into the arena without the banana suit, but was caught again. It was right here against LaSalle on March 8th during his final home game as the banana that Schneider was escorted out by police. After I went back in, they found me in the bleachers. Uh, I'm not sure if it was a sheriff or security, but they interacted and they pulled me out and asked me to leave again. Schneider was ticketed for a trespassing violation and is due at Allegheny Town Court March 21st. He said he is unsure of the severity of his penalty, but expects to be fined. I'm not a lawyer, I'm just a college student that had some fun at a basketball game. Schneider said he disagrees with the decision to ticket him, but he'll use his premature demise as the banana as a learning experience. It's a process that's going to have to play itself out, but I don't think being kicked out in the first place was necessary, and I guess we'll see what happens from here. For SBU TV, I'm Tyler Deidre. St. Bonaventure's Office of Judicial Affairs has also requested to speak to Schneider, but the two sides have not yet met. After a 3-6 record during its Florida trip to start the season, the St. Bonaventure baseball team hosted Little Three rival Niagara Tuesday in the 2011 home opening doubleheader at Fred Handler Park. The Bonnies took Game 1 from the Purple Eagles 3-1 and put five runs on the scoreboard in the bottom of the first inning of Game 2. Third baseman Billy Irvin's two-run double in the second made it 7-0. A Brad Steinbeck ground out brought Ryan Skelly to the plate. Skelly ripped a double of his own down the left field line to plate Urban and make it 8 0 Bonnies. The Purple Eagles loaded the bases at the top of the third, but reliever Andrew Revelo forced the 6 4 3 double play to escape the jam. St. Bonaventure went on to win the game 9 1. After a three game set at Marshall this weekend, the Bonnies return home on Tuesday to host the University at Buffalo. For the third consecutive year, the St. Bonaventure women's basketball team was in the WNIT. In this year's tournament, they took on Lehigh in the first round. The Bonnies jumped out quickly with good execution on inbounds plays. First it was Megan Van Tatenhove with a jumper and then Jessica Jenkins a three. Van Tatenhove then extended the lead to double digits with a layup from a nice pass from Doris Otega. Alexis Williams tried to keep Lehigh close with a layup of her own. However, Jenkins responded with another three, this one from the corner. That was followed by a three from teammate Chelsea Bowker from the top of the key. And then Elena Walker got the Bonnies lead to 20 by beating the shot clock. St. Bonaventure rolled 77 to 43. Next up for the Bonnies is Syracuse in the Carrier Dome on Monday. That's all for this week on SPU TV. I'm Kevin Clark. And I'm Connor Mooney. For the rest of us here in the Coop Lab, thanks for watching.